Coming up, snow day. As parts of the country get hit with a winter blast this week, we'll look at the science of snow. Then President's Day explained. Plus, sweeping the competition. We'll introduce you to these brothers who are hoping to inspire other kids to give one popular winter sport a try. And the Tiger's Apprentice. How did you do that? Our Kids Edition correspondent takes us behind the scenes of a new movie just in time for the Chinese New Year. What zodiac animal are you? I'm actually a tiger. I am a horse. I am a wood ox. What are the biggest messages or lessons you hope kids and parents take away from this film? I hope that people take away from the film that um, friendship is really important, that you can't do things alone. This is NBC Nightly News, Kids Edition. Welcome back, everyone, to Nightly News Kids Edition. I'm Lester Holt. It's always great to be with you. Hope you're having a terrific week. We have an awesome lineup ahead, including our picture of the week, plus a new movie with an important message this time of year for both kids and grown-ups. But let's begin with one of the stories making headlines this week, and it's something some of us have not seen much of this winter, snow. People in the Northeast got hit with a powerful winter storm this week, the first big snowfall of the season for many people, and it got us thinking just what exactly is snow? Our good friend and meteorologist Dylan Dreyer explains. From snowball fights to snowmen to snow angels, they all have one thing in common, snow. But what exactly is snow? What we call snow is really millions of tiny ice crystals. Under a microscope, these crystals are beautiful and intricate, and no two are exactly alike. When it gets cold enough, water in the air that might usually come down as rain freezes. Think of it like this. When warm air rises, it cools and condenses into a cloud that could eventually produce rain, just like we're seeing water droplets develop on the outside of this glass here. Now this glass has been sitting in the freezer, so as the warm air rises and condenses, it develops into more of a frost. It's creating ice crystals instead of water droplets. And that's exactly what we see happen in a cloud. When the temperatures are below freezing, we see snowflakes form instead of raindrops. To take that a step further, the water vapor needs to condense onto something just like it did on that glass. So it finds little particles in the air. Think dust or pollen or dirt. So it condenses onto that little particle in the air and then it continues to crystallize and grow until it becomes a nice big snowflake and then it falls to the ground as snow. Did you know snowflakes have six sides and every snowflake looks different? The temperature of the air determines the shape of the six-sided snowflake. The most common shapes are needles, plates, dendrites, columns, and prisms. Scientists estimate as many as a septillion snowflakes fall to Earth each year. That's a one with 24 zeros after it. <laughs> Don't worry, even if it's warm outside, there's an easy way to make your own snow at home and you probably already have all the ingredients. Just make sure it's okay with your parents or a grown-up. All you need is baking soda and top it off with an equal amount of shaving cream. You'll stir that together and look at this, snow. Want to help me make a snowball? Look at that. So no matter where you live, you can enjoy the magic of winter and the science of snow. Just be sure to bundle up, be safe, and enjoy. All right, Dylan, thanks so much. And since we just talked about snowflakes, it's time for our pop quiz. The question this week, true or false, snowflakes are white. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Okay, time's up. You can probably smell. This is a trick question, kind of. The answer is false. Snowflakes are not actually white. Snowflakes are translucent. 
This means that light passes through, but not directly. The light reflects off the snowflake, making it appear white, with the many sides of the snowflake scattering light in many directions. That's a great little factoid to know to bring that on any time you want. Well, Monday, February 19th, marks President's Day. It's a federal holiday, and that means no school. But did you ever wonder just how did this national holiday come about? Let's get details from our pal Peter Alexander. President's Day, it's a holiday we celebrate every February. President's Day is an excuse for all of us to say, you know, let's learn some new things about a past president and what it tells us about American history. President George Washington, the first president of the United States, is a big part of that history and why President's Day is officially called Washington's birthday. President's Day, as we now call it, is still legally a federal holiday called George Washington's birthday, but almost no one knows that. Uh, you kids are going to be some of the few that actually know that it's really not called President's Day. Legally, it's George Washington's birthday. President's Day originally celebrated Washington's birthday on February 22nd, but that changed in the late 1960s. President Lyndon Johnson and Congress thought, why don't we find some way of making sure that everyone is on the same page? So they said, why don't we have a three-day weekend in February around the time of George Washington's birthday, and we can just call it President's Day and study all the presidents of the United States in history on that day even though it's Washington's birthday. So Congress passed the Uniform Monday Holiday Act to give government workers more three-day weekends. Now we celebrate each year on the third Monday in February that always falls between February 15th and the 21st. So ironically, the holiday marking Washington's birthday never actually occurs on his birthday. And it usually falls pretty close to another famous president's birthday, Abraham Lincoln. He was born on February 12th. Many people use the day to celebrate his birthday, too, which is why we typically call the holiday President's Day. Four U.S. presidents were actually born in February, Washington, Lincoln, William Henry Harrison, and Ronald Reagan. President's Day is important. It reminds us that it's a very good idea to remember in American history how much it has mattered who happened to be president of the United States or not. If someone had been president other than Abraham Lincoln or George Washington or Franklin Roosevelt, we might not be living in the country that we are. And speaking of American history, did you know Abraham Lincoln was born in a log cabin? Grover Cleveland was the only U.S. president to serve two non-consecutive terms. He served as our 22nd and 24th president. Calvin Coolidge was said to be a practical joker and liked to ring the White House doorbell and then hide. And President Washington never lived in Washington, D.C. He's the only president to have never occupied the White House. So if you're looking for a sweeter way to celebrate our founding father, rumor has it a young George Washington chopped down a cherry tree. So maybe a piece of cherry pie. All right, Peter, thanks. And cherry pie sounds really good to me. Let's head to Florida now for our picture of the week. The Palm Beach Zoo and Conservation Society just announced the birth of a two-toed baby sloth. We're told both mom and baby are doing well, and they're being monitored by the zoo's veterinarian and animal staff in their specialized habitat. Did you know that wild sloths thrive holding onto branches upside down on trees in Central and South America's tropical forests? It's pretty cool. Get to hang out all day in the trees. Meantime, as people celebrated Valentine's Day this week, the Houston Zoo celebrated the first birthday of the Pickles triplets. We visited these tiny radiated tortoises last year after the discovery of their eggs surprised zookeepers and led to a delicate five-month incubation process. Dill, Gherkin, and Jalapeno, I love the names, hatched on February 14th of last year. And since then, they've grown almost six times their original size, weighing in at a whopping quarter pound. Happy birthday, Pickles family. In this week's Spotlight, the Chinese New Year got underway on February 10th and will continue for two plus weeks. It's the year of the dragon. It's one of the 12 creatures in the Chinese Zodiac. And there's a new animated movie rated PG that's hoping to teach kids about these creatures, the Lunar New Year, and so much more. 
Our Kids Edition correspondent Chloe caught up with the cast of The Tiger's Apprentice to find out more. For many of the more than 24 million Asian Americans in the United States, Lunar New Year is a time to come together with family, practice traditions, and eat lots of good food. Each Lunar New Year is represented by one of the 12 Chinese zodiac animals. Each one is said to have different personality traits, strengths, and weaknesses. To find out which zodiac animal you are, look for the year you were born. My dad is a tiger, and my mom and I are dragons. Dragons are considered strong, wise, and lucky. Rats are said to be thoughtful, organized, and hardworking. Tigers are believed to be adventurous, brave, and determined. And guess what? These animals also happen to be characters in a new movie about the Chinese zodiac called The Tiger's Apprentice. I had the chance to speak with the cast and crew of this exciting new film. What zodiac animal are you? I'm actually a tiger. I am a horse. I am a wood ox. Pig. I don't know what material the pig is made of, but that's what I am. Actor and martial artist Brandon Suhu is the voice of 15-year-old Tom Lee, who learns that he is part of a long line of guardians with special powers. How did you do that? With help from the Zodiac, Tom must protect the Phoenix and save the world from the evil villain Will. I can remake the world without humans. One thing that Tom's really good at doing is, you know, being able to maintain a positive uh, outlook on things when things get tough, which is something that a lot of people could really benefit from, you know, taking into difficulties in their life is to be able to stay positive and, you know, still find the humor in, in really um, tough situations. I really enjoy watching Tom kind of find comfort with expressing his own identity and, you know, sinking into his role as, as the guardian. It's time to start your training. Oh, it's on. Tom is joined on his journey by his friend, Rob, who is voiced by Leo Lewis. You see Rav when she first meets Tom and they kind of connect over being different. They're definitely outsiders um, when it comes to how they're fitting along in school. Wait, 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 hold on. Are you okay? Yeah, great. You know, you see her throughout the course of this film really support Tom in so many ways that are big and small. And um, I love that she was able to play that role for Tom. Tom, focus. I can't. Uh, I'm losing it. Just breathe. Find something to hold on to, something to anchor yourself. It's OK. You're OK. I think with Rav, she kind of represents this, this sense of pride in being who she is and being comfortable with that, despite it being different. And different is not always a bad thing. Different can be a really good thing. It's what makes us unique. Introducing our one of the Zodiacs is a rat named Sydney, voiced by actor Bowen Yang. What are the biggest messages or lessons you hope kids and parents take away from this film? I hope that people take away from the film that um, friendship is really important, that you can't do things alone, that um, you know things are scary in life sometimes. And if you have like a care team around you, if you have like a support system around you the way that Tom does, with the Zodiac animals, I think it's helpful. I think it gives you the spirit you need to just achieve anything you, you can, anything you want to, even though you think you can at first. Raman Lee is the movie's director. My favorite part of directing this movie was I got to work with amazing cast of talents like Henry Golding. No pinching necessary, all right? Well, we, we spoke about this. Brandon Soho. Team Zodiac, assemble. Lucy Louis. Who dares wake the Empress Nakuma? Leah Lewis. What the heck just happened? Sherry Cola. We got to free the other Zodiacs. Sandra O. Oh. How about we all take a break and cool off? Michelle Yeoh. Without humans. They're all amazing. I just, uh, had a, had a blast working with them because they're so fun to work with and they gave us so rich characters that we can animate to. We can make this easy. You know what I want, old woman. I hope the 
kids and parents after they watch this movie they will understand Tom's story and then how he learn to not solve his problem by fighting. I think Denis as a rat really helps him do that because Tom just doesn't quite understand or realize where his power is coming from. It's not from this, it's not from his fists, it's from within, it's from his heart, it's from his mind. It's a film that has so much culture and heritage and it's a film about learning to be proud of that too. Also, the cast and crew are celebrating Lunar New Year on and off. The big screen. How do you say Happy Lunar New Year in your family? My family says Kung Hei Fa Choi. Yes, so in Mandarin, uh, which is what my family speaks, we say Gong Si Fa Tai. Gong Hei Fa Choi, something by law. Where we say Xin Yan Kuai Le, which is Happy New Year, literally. Gong Hei Fa Choi. Gong Hei Fa Choi. Xin Yan Kuai Le. Or we say Wan Shi Ru Yi, which is like, may you prosper for um, many years. So I just say Happy Lunar New Year. I love you. <laughs> Whether or not your family is celebrating Lunar New Year, The Tiger's Apprentice can teach you more about this amazing celebration, as well as the power of friendship, family, and tradition. It's in your blood. For Nightly News Kids Edition, I'm Chloe. Happy Lunar New Year. Gung Hee Fa Choi. Okay, Chloe, thanks very much for that. So great to have you on Kids Edition. The Tiger's Apprentice, by the way, is streaming now. Finally, in our inspiring kids series, it's a popular sport that requires a broom, a stone, and some ice. We're talking about the sport of curling, and two brothers are hoping to inspire other kids to follow in their footsteps. Let's get details now from our friend Gabriella Rudy. Meet Carter and Tucker Hellman. 11-year-old twins breaking the ice about a sport sliding into popularity, curling. After watching Team USA win gold in 2018, the twins were swept up. I was like, this is really cool. I really want to try this. When the boys first came to you with an interest in curling, what were your thoughts? Never in a million years did I think, oh yeah, my kids are going to be curling, you know? It was harder than it looks, but the strategy and the sweeping and everything was really fun. As the twins told me, curling is not as easy as it seems. It takes a mix of precision, accuracy, athleticism, and of course, sweeping. Here's how it works. Two teams take turns sliding heavy stones toward a target area called the house. Sweeping in front of the stone helps it move faster. The objective is to have your team stones closest to the center of the house to score points. Okay, sweep. Back in 2011, even Lester caught the curling bug himself. Let her go. Good job. Say nothing to it. It's going pretty far. And found out some hard truths about this simple game. <laughs> It's all about muscle memory. I'll learn how it feels so that you can uh, continue it next time and be consistent with your shots. The twins started curling when they were seven, and after years of hard work, they were ready to rock the biggest rink, the under 18 nationals. Like this was the big deal. I was nervous, of course. I mean, I feel like a lot of people are in the first day in the first nationals events. Um, we were also very excited and fortunate. The kids there were like 17, 18, 16, and we were only like 10, 10 when we were there. Yeah. So they were huge compared to us. They didn't know it at the time, but they were the youngest competitors in the entire tournament. How did it feel to be the youngest ones at that competition? When uh, someone finally told us, we were like, wow, that's uh, it's a big milestone to go to nationals, and especially to be uh, the youngest. It's very impressive, yeah. They didn't win, but the tournament inspired Carter and Tucker to start a YouTube channel to help them with their game. Hi, it's Carter Hellman, and hi, it's Tucker Hellman, and welcome to Carlin Chronicles, Paying It Forward. One of their coaches weighed in early on. This is Gabrielle Coleman, and she wrote a book called Introduction to Curling Strategy. It's really amazing what they've been able to do in such a short period of time. Uh, and they also just love to curl. These brothers have a secret weapon. We have this telepathy thing. And also, we kinda, as twins, we bring each other up when the team gets down. And uh, He's like my own personal therapist. <laughs> they plan to be sweeping the competition for years to come. A big goal of ours 
is to go to the Olympics. And to show, like make curling a more known sport. And I want them to see like, um, you can do it, and it doesn't matter what age you are, you can be 70 or 10. Curling prodigies, turning heads and rocks, and showing all generations that it's never too early or too late to learn something new. Gabriella, thanks very much. It's a really fun sport. That's going to do it for us parents. Just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, Email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Thanks for watching and remember to take care of yourself and each other. So long.